Lucky you. 36 Turn pistols and golf. Alternate Shots Podcast. Barney's Army. Where we talk about golf. Sandy. Poker. James Bond. Horse racing. Double. Classic movies. Zenyatta. We have no script. Down the stretch they come. We are glad you joined us. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> Hey, Billy, we've got a couple of announcements for the Alternate Shots podcast. If you like our content, we ask you to please hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. You'll be aware of all the new episodes that come onto the channel. Billy Regan, what a magnificent day in August. Who do we have here with us today? We have the one and only John Neoporti, one of, I shouldn't say the one and only, one of the hundreds and hundreds of Neoportis who are spanning the globe and affecting golf for decades and decades from they're like swifties they're all over the place <laughs> so, uh, today we're going to talk about tom neoporti with the help of john who was uh, a husband father great father grandfather great grandfather maybe and a yes. friend but most importantly i think everyone would remember him as a gentleman extraordinaire so john welcome to the podcast where we're going to talk about Tom Neoporti, the legend, the Wingfoot legend. It's, it's great to be here, guys. And, uh, you know, it's it's an honor to be on this podcast with you talking about my father. It's great. We uh, loved you, Dad. We might as well start with that. Well, he loved Wingfoot. He loved all the members. And it was a big family. And it changed his life. He just loved uh, pulling through those gates every single day going into work. He he just loved it. I, I There are very few people at Wingfoot that were more positive than your dad. There were a There's couple very few people guys. in the world more positive. Yeah, in the world, on the planet. Yeah. And I agree and, with that. And guess what? He left that on you. It he was did. kind of like going through the uh, Bloomingdale's perfume counter and you got spritzed. You got spritzed <laughs> by the charm of Tom Neoporti. You know, that's so true. I, you know, as a as a young boy growing up, uh, my dad, you know, led by example and and uh he never said, I've never heard my father say a cuss word in, in his entire life ever. I think Jiminy Christmas, when he said Jiminy Christmas, you knew that he was, he you're on the, on the wrong side, uh, that uh, he was, he was mad. Uh, but he never said a bad word about anybody. He, he lived his life by the golden rule, truly did treat others the way you want to be treated. And, and uh, just, just a remarkable hero, mentor, everything. Get a little we, we like here. his golden rule. We're going to talk about that. One of the things that we all loved, and Billy used to do this uh, quite often, is sneak down to the range, right, Billy? And yep, and just to... watch him hit. <clears throat> yeah, I just would sit behind him. He knew I was there. <laughs> I'd say, I don't want a lesson. I just want to watch you hit balls. It, and it would sink right in. I, I was the same way as a kid growing up. I mean, I, I didn't really start golfing until I was 18. I could always hit a golf ball, but... I would watch my father. And one thing my dad did tell me, though, he said, look at pictures, John. He said, don't don't read what they're saying because you need to formulate your own your 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 own feels and sentences in your head of your own golf swing. You know, look at pictures, look at the rhythm. He was very big on rhythm, timing. He said that if you had good, good rhythm and timing, we'll take you through a round of golf if you if you're if you're not on your A game and you could just see it in his swing. Let's take a look. Uh, yeah. Love to hear the sound of the ball hit the club head. <laughs> Simple. That felt great. <laughs> cool. Yeah. A little short iron to nine east. Man. He can still move it, boy. The rest of my life. I like to hit him like that the rest of my life. How many times <laughs> do you think he said that, John? Come on. Uh, every time he every time he hit a golf ball, he would he would say that. Or or what he would do is is he would he would hit a golf ball and he and he'd take a seven iron out and he did a seven iron so high and he'd look back and say that was as high as the Georgia Pines. Or he's <laughs> like he'd say, I'm gonna hit these balls and I'm gonna I'm gonna rate them with desserts. And he'd he'd hit a ball and look over and say, That was ice cream and cake right there. That was mincemeat pie. And every shot was perfect. It was like a Ditto Xerox copy of the one before. And, and, you know, when you're looking at it, it was just amazing. He just had so much fun. He had fun. It, it was like he never got out of uh, Clovernook where he grew up learning how to play golf. It was like every time he hit a golf ball, it was like the first time he hit a golf ball. It was he just get a big smile on his face like that. Just loved it. Loved it. It's a little unusual in in that 
the professional golfers we've talked to, Susie Maxwell, Burning, Judy Rankin, Jackie Burke, and, and all kinds of other, Billy Harmon, all the Harmons, they all learned from somebody. It seems to me like your dad had a different path. He did. My father started golfing as a, you know, like a lot of kids back then in the, in the 40s as, as a caddy at Clovernook Country Club in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he'd uh, walk down the street with his with his buddies, uh, Jack Wilcotty and uh, Leonard Wirtz, and they'd go out and caddy. And on the 13th hole, there was a pond in front of the, the green and, and the ladies would say, Tom, can you hit my ball over the water? I don't want to lose it. So my dad would drop the bags and hit the ball over over on the green. And that's when he started learning how to play golf. And he would save up money and he'd buy a, buy a club. And, and his first set of clubs were all mixed max uh, ladies clubs. About your dad growing up and hit, hitting the seven iron over the pond for the ladies while he was caddying for him. I guess he did that. What, did he drop the bags or do you have the bags on his shoulder and swung? Is he that talented? <laughs> oh, no, no. He said he dropped the bags and then he'd take out the the seven iron and, and uh, you know, whip the ball right up on the green. And they loved it because they didn't lose their ball in the water. That's just terrific. Well, let's see a little clip from your dad just about those days. I think there may be a picture of that pond in here. It seemed like golf was good to me as a as a young boy growing up. We made 75 cents and we gave the caddy match for 10 cents of our 75 cents. So we went over 65 cents. It's your dad. And this one that's that's in this that's in the uh the, the caddy the caddy tournament that got him to uh, Ohio State right there. He won that tournament. And that's what got him the, the two-year scholarship at Ohio State. Using that's literary right. license, John, this looks like the, the shot that your dad might have hit while he was catting. Let's t take a listen. Right at the bottom of the hill, he always reached in his pocket and gave you a dime. And he said, son, here's your tip. Don't spend it all in one place. <laughs> He said that at, at nighttime he would he, the caddies would be out there on the 18th hole and the members would all be up on the balcony and, and before the members got out there they'd take the flag stick and they'd they'd put it you know they'd put it down lengthwise on the cup and they'd step on it and create a a channel for the ball to go in and they'd all sit there and putt from like 12 feet or you know however long the flag stick was and every ball went in the hole and all the members <laughs> thought the caddies were the best putters in the world he said it helped them with their tips <laughs> they could read the greens good. <laughs> <laughs> when you used to go to the bowling alleys with the kids when they were little, putting the bumpers down the alley. So that's the ball exactly never what it was. Yeah, he was a jokester. My dad liked a kid. He's he's a funny guy. But he so he hit the seven iron for the ladies over the pond. How did he learn how to do that by himself? I, I guess by watching. You know, I mean, a lot a lot of teaching is is uh, how you learn, and I think that he. He would watch the better players and just had a knack. He was a natural. He was a natural golfer. He never had a lesson in his life. Never. never I think it runs. In, I think that runs in the family because your brother Joey, when I first met him, wanted to give me a couple of tips. So he brought me down to the range and I hit a few seven irons, and then he mimicked my swing. So it, he was able to see exactly what I was doing and then not only see it but duplicate it. So. That must run in your family, the ability to spot stuff and mimic it. I think it does. You know, I, you know, everyone in my family, they're all, we're all athletes. My dad encouraged us to play every sport. We, you know, played tennis, rode horses, uh, football, basketball, baseball, but uh, he wanted us to do everything and, and get coordinated with our bodies. He just didn't want us to all play golf, but but uh, Joe was a natural golfer too. Joe, Joe, just by watching my father, I went, as little kids, when in the wintertime, when there were polo fields here in Boca Raton, and we used to go out, my dad used to hit balls out in the polo field, and we'd catch the balls with mitts. And uh, just watching his rhythm and, and his swing, it was simple. It was a very simple move. It, there was no jerky movements. It was poetry in motion, true poetry in motion. And just, you know, everyone wants to be like their father. And uh, Joe just probably watched my father hit thousands of golf balls, and it just – just seeped in and uh, same thing with me. I think I was a little bit more mechanical than my brother, Joe. Joe helped me a lot with, with my golf swing and my game when I started playing, but he is, he is an eye and, and uh, a great player, great putter, short game, crazy short game. And so did my father. That's, that's one thing that a lot of people didn't really um, think about my father of having a tremendous short game. He was a great bunker player and had hands like unbelievable around the greens. 
We we saw him demonstrate that in clinics at member guests time after time after time, stepping on balls in the bunker and hitting them out anyway. Hitting them out with six irons. Yeah. Yeah. He was I remember that as a as, as a little kid, uh, you know, out there. And I, I remember one one time, uh, which was a special time, my father and I had the chance, just the two of us, to go out and play the back nine at Wingfoot. And and uh I think I was probably 17 years old. Uh, just starting to, didn't know if I was going to play football in college or golf, didn't know really what I was going to do. We got to the 13th hole, par three, and the pin was all the way back right. And my father, of course, hit the ball right in the middle of the green at about a 15 foot putt. And I hit my ball in the right bunker all the way down in that right bunker. So I get down in the bunker and I take out my sandwich and knock it 10 feet where my, where basically where my, my father's ball was rolled all the way across the green. And my dad goes, now, John, uh, he goes, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a shot. And he walks down and, and he has a three iron in his hand. And he said, not every time you have to, my father was, was so big on visualization. And that's probably why his swing was the way it was. And that's how he learned visually. And he said, you have to visualize the shot and you have to be creative. And he took out that three iron and he ran that three iron up the face of the lip of that bunker and it, go, and it went straight up in the air about six feet in the air, landed on the other side of the lip and rolled down to about a foot. And I, I, that shot, I will never forget for the rest of my life. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. How can you even think of that? And uh, it was, he just had an imagination and, and uh, just, he knew how much weight to put on that ball. It's just, it, it was just really something special. It's just, you know, Nicholas said about my father, Tom Neoporty would have been a household name if he was a selfish individual, but he wanted to be a family man. And, and uh, he, he was that talented. I remember seeing Tom's short game firsthand. We were playing in one of these play with the pros at Wingfoot. Billy, you've done that. And we're coming in pretty good and we're just desperate for a three on 17 East, which he had pulled his foreiron <clears throat> over to the left and he was sort of on that down slope. He said, I'm going to take this foreiron. He still had his foreiron and he smashed it into the hill in front of him like the shot you just described. It popped up onto the green, ding, 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 about six feet. And you know, he made the putt. Oh, yeah. It was the best three I think I've ever seen because every other person would have taken out their sandwich and duffed it, got it to the bottom, maybe got it on and made five. But he he just you're right. He was very creative. Very, very creative. Yep. And he would he would talk about it all the time. He he was very simple the way he would he would tell me how to, you know, he put two T's in my hands and taught me the grip. And then he'd say, point the T to your right shoulder and then, then wind your shoulders up and unwind them. It was that simple. It was so simple. It, it was ridiculous to my father, but uh, he had an eye, uh, my brother, Joe had an eye and some, some guys are gifted like that. And my well, they also, they, they, they seem to be having so much fun and the game is obviously we all know a lot easier to play when you're not, overboard trying that hard if you're just enjoying yourself it sometimes comes easier and he looked like he was having a great time the whole time you're exactly right he, he, that's exactly right he was having a blast well we heard from billy harman who you know and billy was a thing he was he was he was a good golfer but he's out there playing with his dad and his dad could still play he played in the west course and billy played pretty well he scraped it around didn't hit all these greens, but he got a 69 coming in. You know, when your dad was still able to play and you guys are coming up, did you ever have moments like that where you were out there and shooting 60, you know, shooting 64? Uh, well, I, I wish we did, but, uh, you know, with nine kids, my father, my, you know, my father back then, he was on that lesson tee at Wingfoot from eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night. And and uh, we, we did have our moments. We never competed though, but that's the difference between two professionals. And my, my father would, would uh say you can do anything you want to do and you put your mind to it and you can do it and and uh my dad was very he was a very humble person as you know he would say great round of golf he wouldn't even mention what he shot he you know that's the type of person he was he would always take a back seat and and empower and 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 encourage somebody else and you know uh that's just the way he was he just he treated everyone the way he would want to be treated just an amazing man and he passed that on to you guys, which is makes it 
even more amazing. Yeah, he was like I said, and my and my mother too. My mother was the my mother was more like Claude Harmon. I'll tell you that. Uh, she was <laughs> she was the one. She she would she would put you in your place. You know, I remember one time coming home from a from a mini tour event. And I shot sixty six, and my mom we're sitting at the table. My dad's there, and and uh, what did you shoot? Where I got shot sixty six today, right? Not skipping a beat. My mother goes, "That was today. What are you going to do tomorrow?" <laughs> so my mother was the compass. She would bring you. She'd snap. She would pull you right back to reality and keep your nose to the grindstone, and and uh, she would make you work hard. And and uh, you know, that's they were a great team. Those two. Did your mom live over by Simon White Country Club when she was young? She did. That's how my father and my mother met. My dad, uh, uh, you know, grad graduated from Ohio State, won the NCAs there, and then got a job as a teaching pro at Simon White Country Club. And and my mother, my mother's father and mother, there were members there. And my mother didn't play golf. Her sister did, and her sister Rita, who's actually a member of Wingfoot. Uh, would come home and say, Oh, there's a new, there's a new teaching pro at the club. He's so cute. And <laughs> and my mother didn't play golf. And uh there one night there was a novena at the church, and my father went to it, it as at seven o'clock, and my mother was sitting in the pew by herself. And my dad went up to her and said, Is this seat taken next to her? And she looked at my father and I guess Cupid slung the arrow and, and she said no. And they started, you know, they went to the novena and then they started, he said, Would you like to go get a uh a Coca-Cola. So they, they would actually meet out at the, like on the back nine of the golf course, because my mother lived right on the, right on the golf course there. And right uh, off the 15th tee there. Right off the 15th tee. And, and uh, the funny, st the funny thing about it is they had, uh, they had three or four dogs that were, that would get out every once in a while and run out on the golf course. And they go up and they'd bark at the members and, and, uh, you know, my when my father was out there, the dogs would run over to him and kind of lick his hands. And my mother would bring the dogs to their meetings. And when they'd go out and, and see each other on the course and everyone started thinking, hey, you know, why are these dogs so nice to Tom? And they're so <laughs> mean to everybody else. So the gig was up. <laughs> he had chaperones. He so did. Couple, he did. Catholic church in, uh, in Bronx. Tom Kerrigan, that was his first job as a uh, professional working for Tom Kerrigan at Sirenoy. It was his first job, and a funny story about that, guys, is that uh, when he when he when he won the NCAs, they just came out with the high speed camera, and the, and they came to Ohio State and they took a, 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 a ton of pictures of my father swinging the golf club, and they gave the a stack of photos of my dad's golf swing, all all synchronized, and he took them over to Simon, and he couldn't wait to go there because he wanted Claude Harmon to look at his swing. Because Claude Harmon just won the Masters, and my father knew that he was the head pro of Wingfoot, so he he uh, made an appointment to come over to see uh, Mr. Harmon, and uh, he brings the stack of pictures into into the office, and my father's sitting in the chair. He said he's shaking like a leaf, and Claude Harmon's got the the pictures, and he's flipping through them, flipping through them, flipping through them, flipped through like ten, picked the other two up. Handed the pictures back to my father and said, son, you've got a great golf swing, but if you don't change your grip, you'll never amount to anything. So back then, my father had a caddy grip. He His left thumb would go, he gripped the club like a baseball bat, and then he'd stick his hand on like that. So this thumb was down here like this. Uh -huh. and Claude Harmon picked that up, and he said, that thumb, and that's why I think my father set the club so well in the beginning as a kid. Because, uh, you know, it just feels natural, like a baseball uh, bat. And that's what Claude Harmon said to him. My dad said he left and he went back to Simonoy and he said he put his thumb underneath and, and the rest is history. Craig Wood told me that when he hired dad, he asked my dad, what type of player you want to be? And he said, well, I want to be like you. And we called him Uncle Craig. And Uncle Craig said, uh, well, the way you hold on to the club and that snap hook you hit, you won't get out of Westchester County. <laughs> and so my dad, which was true, he said, well, I love the game. I'll do whatever it takes. And Craig Wood said, yeah, well, a lot of people say that, but when the improvement doesn't come right away, they'll retreat back to what feels good. And he said, your father got mad at me and said, I'll do what it takes. And so he did do what it took. Let's take a look at your dad's swing. Here we go. I'm going to let you sure. diagnose it, John. Here it comes. This is right after his big win. At the uh, Bob Hope, where you know we didn't really cover that for a second, but this is right after he made that fabulous twelve footer on his eighteenth hole. But 
yet he hadn't been uh, declared the winner yet. There was somebody still out in the course. Who was it? That was Doug Sanders. Doug Sanders, uh, my father, Bertie, the, the 18th hole to take a one shot lead. And, and the flamboyant Doug Sanders was coming in, uh, you know, and, and he actually had about a, a, maybe a 14 foot putt to tie my father. And uh, fortunately the, the, the ball just, just went by the hole and, my dad won the 1967 Bob Hope, his biggest win of his career. <laughs> so that's another thing that your dad and Nichols have in common. They both beat Doug Sanders. Well, oh, yeah. But anyway, here is the swing. I just like to watch. Well, right off the bat, you can see how, how graceful the, the backswing is with the setting of the hands and one thing you'll 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 notice right off the bat too is this the 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 timing. It was not a rush swing at all. His angles were, were were perfect. Big shoulder turn, big leg action right there. You can see the the setting of the hands. That club is, uh, you know, straight across the top, right down his heel line. You can see his 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 weight is in in the in the in the right heel, uh, on his right side, and on the ball of his foot on the left, and he's totally loaded up. Big shoulder turn and 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 actually hip turn too. The, you know the left hips below the right. He's loading up, and then, and then you'll you'll watch his left knee will will kick out and start moving his weight to his left side, and the club will the club will just drop. It'll you can see the whole shaft, and then once his hands get to hip high, he just unwinds everything he has. Like he would say, just hit hit through the ball, unwind those shoulders. Uh, and, and that's what you'll see in his swing. It was just simple. He, you could tell by his swing, he didn't have many thoughts and, you know, swing thoughts. He, yeah, you know, is wind your shoulders up and unwind them. And, and you can see that in his swing, but for a natural golfer, I, I don't think there's a better, better, more fluid swing. Oh, that I, tempo is unbelievable. Tempo. It unbelievable. really was. We get we get we get in trouble here because the people that own the Arnold Palmer licensing are thinking we're using Palmer's backswing here. I think your dad was much handsomer than the king, but anyway, well, I, tell, let's take a look. I tell you what, my dad's favorite golfer was Byron Nelson. So there's a lot of Byron Nelson. My dad watched a ton of his swings as growing up, and and uh, and that's one thing. When I started playing golf, my father gave me this little flip book of Sam Snead, and you'd flip the pages and you'd see Sam Snead's swing and and it was my dad's and uh and those pages were worn out but just in the top right corner you could if you flip the book through you'd see the the sequence of Sam Snead swing and and i think that um like we've been talking the rhythm and sequencing i don't think my father thought thought about angles or force plates or any of that but you know it's just there's the ball how hard do i have to hit it to hit it to the target where i need it to go and he would, he just did it and sticking to the pictures to instruct rather than or words right Which exactly peter jacobson well known for impersonating people's swings funny swings and really good swings it if he was swinging your dad's swing it would probably be the same as slamming sammy sneed right it would be no yep. difference yeah well let's well, take a look at this maybe session. he would have won more <laughs> <laughs> sammy didn't have nine children that's right <laughs> all right here we go let's look at that left knee the real natural right there that that's that was the trigger for my father's golf swing that left knee right ball. there would just kick out and then once he got his weight on the ball of that left foot he just unwound on it Fabulous. and as you know in his later years his knees were were going out and that's natural swing of your dad's the comparison to sammy sneed you know i never thought of it until we started to look at sammy sneed swing in another uh podcast that we had the very similar, no no thoughts going through his mind, no tension. And we're showing a picture here of the 2006 U.S. Open at Wingfoot, backdrop of the clubhouse, and in the picture is the winner, and in the picture is your famous dad. What? Yeah. What uh, What story did you have? Somebody who's not have? in the picture. What, what? There's somebody who's not in the picture who's <laughs> who's one of the main characters of the 2006 U.S. <laughs> Open. So we'll turn it over to you, John. Well, one thing, speaking about the photo, you can look at my father's eyes. His eyes are so glued on that trophy. Look at that. That's yeah, just something absolutely. else. He, That's he loved that. He wants to snatch it out of his hands. Oh, he <laughs> wants to tell Ogilvy to use an interlocking grip with that. That's right. That's right. But uh, he loved the game. But 
But uh, interesting story. Before the Open there in 2006, Phil Mickelson called my father and, and asked to come out and and uh, uh, if he could play golf with my father to learn the course. So they 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 head to the first tee after warming up, and my father stopped at the white tees, and Phil kept walking back to the blues. And he turns around and goes, Tom, uh, would you come back here and and uh, show me the lines? I want you to to show me where I need to hit hit the tee shots from. So Phil takes one one step from the cut line of the rough. And, and tees off and hauls out and hits his driver. And my father starts walking up to the white tee. And Phil said, Mr. Neoporti, where are you going? Uh, you haven't hit yet. And, and my dad goes, well, I'm going to go play the white tees. And Phil said, well, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to, I'd like you to hit from back here because I want to watch you uh, play back here. And my father said, I haven't played the the tips or the blue tees in, in the last 15 years here. But Phil, Phil uh, said, you know, I'd, I'd really like you to play back here with me so we can spend the time together and I can watch you play. So, so my father did it. And, uh, and, and the first iron he hit into to a green was a six iron into the, into the seventh hole. And uh, he was even par for the front nine. And I think he shot a couple over from the, from the tips, but uh, it was a special day. And then, and then fast forward a, a couple of months and Phil called my father again and he, he asked to come out and he said, uh, Mr. Neoporty, this time I just want to bring four golf balls out to every green. And I want you to throw the, you know, throw the balls around the green and show me where you think the pins will be and uh, show me where I need to hit the, 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 the recovery shot in order to, to get it close. And so they did that for a day and they're in having lunch in the grill room. And, and Phil said, Mr. Neoporty, what do I need to do to win the open here? What's the, what's the, the best advice you can give me? And my father said, Phil, if you play the last four holes and even par in the tournament, this, you'll win the tournament. And we all know what he did on the 18th hole, uh, yeah. but uh, you know it was more the advice. I will say that at that time he was an honorary member, if you will, of Wingfoot. He was signing Masters uh, flags and giving them to the Bunazette kids because it was their yeah. birthday, and coming on the terrace and shaking hands, and and everybody loved him, and everybody was rooting for him. Another one from my father. So so years go by, and I and my dad and I are just talking. I go, Dad. Are they going to put a plaque out on the on the uh, uh, on the 18th hole where Phil Mickelson hit his tee shot over <laughs> in, to the left in the rough over there by I think by the 11th of the East and and without skipping a beat my dad looked back at me and said no they're going to put a tombstone there. <laughs> well, I don't know if you were there to see it, but they I was on my couch and I I actually told my wife because I watched it uh, I I couldn't get up there when Phil was on, he had to wait because Kyle Montgomery was out in the fairways you remember him hawing uh, seven iron six iron blah 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 yeah. and uh, Phil sitting there waiting 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 and then when the camera goes back on him and he pulls out his driver I I yelled into my wife in the kitchen I said I said Tracy get in here this guy's about to lose the U.S. Open on the 18th hole at Wingfoot. And my wife came in and she goes, how did you know he was going to do that? Now, Phil, if you remember the tournament, he drove the ball horribly. He missed the seven, the fairway on 17. He missed 16. And I'm thinking all he had to do was pull out a three iron and win the open. And, and we all know what happened. It was the saddest thing. And, and uh, you know, a, a side note on that, my brother Jay was actually in the golf shop when Phil came in there, he got trapped. And um, Phil was in there signing a scorecard and then everyone left. It was just, him and Amy, but my brother Jay was in my father's office and the door was like, he, he kind of shut the door and he, he said that, uh, you know, Phil was devastated, totally devastated saying, I can't believe what I just did. I'm so stupid. And, and, uh, I can't believe it. I just lost the U S open. He, he, I think it, uh, you know, it was, it was, a, a you know, an, an, an unfortunate moment in the, in the legacy of the history of Wingfoot golf club. But, uh, you know, Jeff Ogilvy did. He chipped in on 17 and, made, and is a great champion there. But Wingfoot, and once Phil, again. Phil Mickelson took Colin Montgomery off the hook. Otherwise, everybody would be talking about him choking it, uh, on 18. That's right. Yeah, no one ever talks about that. Except Perfect for the, uh, from, from what I understand, the, the, the New York State Trooper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a story for another time. Mickelson at the time was the darling of the golf world. Um, he really was approachable. He was, you know, the fan favorite. Like All said, the fans were devastated. USGA tent there. He'd have been over on the fairway. And you've probably been there, John, right? Many, right. many times. Iron. Many times. 
a little seven or eight, maybe even a nine iron over there. It depending on what he wants to do, but just right over the trees, no problem. Stop putting tents on the east course. <laughs> That's exactly right. You're looking at this picture behind my head. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, Bob Hope, and your dad. Two of those people are honorary members. Bob Hope never got the look. You know, uh, Bob Hope, <laughs> a, a frequenter, as Billy and I have heard and seen at Wingfoot, but they just never got around to making him an honorary member. But what a what what a great thing to to have that legacy in your family and people thinking about him like that. I know. Well, it was a real, real a special story. Would be in 1986. Uh, my father rented two Winnebago's uh, during the Christmas uh, holiday, and uh, he made it mandatory that everybody had to go on this trip. So he rented two Winnebago's, and we leave Boca Raton, Florida, and we drove out to California. It was called the <laughs> Neat Forties Cross Country Christmas, and and uh, you know I was born, I was a little, you know, I was a baby in 1967. That's the year I was born. So my father drives us out, and we stop at the Babe Diedrichs and Zaharias Memorial, and on the way out there in Carlsbad Cavern. And we drive out to Palm Springs and my dad drove right out to the golf course and, and he walked us all out on the 18th hole and he, and he, and he showed us exactly where the cup was and where that putt went in he called the pro and set this all up. And then we, we hit some balls on the range and my brother Jay was at the time playing for the Padres and was creaming it. But, but then we all got back in the, in the Winnebago's and we're, my dad's driving the lead one and we were following him. And all of a sudden we come to this gate and this gate opens up and we're, we're going up to the, to, to uh, you know, in, in huge houses, mansions. And we're climbing up, winding around this, this mountain. And we're going through, I think we went through about seven, seven gates. And all of a sudden we pull up to the very top of this mountain. And we're like, where the heck are we going? My, my father had called Bob Hope and said he was in town. And Bob Hope loved my father. He called him the quiet champion. And he invited us up to his house. And we spent the whole day at Bob Hope's house and he toured us through the whole house. And uh, he loved my father and, and Dolores Hope. And we spent the whole day there. And uh, Bob Hope was telling stories about my father. And, and he he um, he just loved going out to that tournament. And Bob Hope was the funniest guy I've ever been around. I mean, every one liner, he was so fast. And, and it was a special, special trip. And, and my father was so proud. And, and it was a great memory. Bob Hope has a reputation for being a very generous and giving person with all, you know, doing all those shows for the troops and stuff like that. So it's not hard to believe that, that, that he would be, uh, you know, so close to your dad. Right. Uh, and when it, actually my father won the all army championship too. So he was, he was in the army during the Korean war. So, so that's, that's probably where they have a tie to Bob Hope and, and had a probably, a, he, you know, as you, you mentioned a great respect for the military and, and that was probably another reason why he he liked my father so much. And and uh, all those guys, think about it, Gene Littler, Orville Moody, all those guys were in the service back then. Um, so do you have a Mo story, a Mo Della Porta story? Or looking at this, this is an interesting coincidence. Your dad was born October 21st, yep. 1928, if I have that right. Yes. And that was the year that Mo started working at Wingfoot. I don't know if he was 13 or 16, but, you know, come 1978, 50 years after Mo had been, you know, smoking up the place with his bearing cigars, he's there. Dad walks in. I Well, Mo, I remember Mo, 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 boy, when you when you walk through that back door, you're a Mo's turf and, and uh, he he ran a tight ship. Those those uh, club cleaners would be buzzing with the with the green soap from the wing foot locker room. He'd take out that that uh, razor blade and put the shavings in there. And and uh, I really when I, I was 11 years old, when my father got the job at wing foot and, and 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 you'd come back there and, and I couldn't even, I couldn't understand what Mo was saying. Half the time it was pizza, pizza, pizza. It was his name yeah. for everybody. Pizza. And he wouldn't yeah. say that to you if he didn't like you. So he must have liked you. Well, well, my brother Joe and Mo forged a great relationship. They, they, they. He, Joe could tell you a million Mo stories. They, though he, Mo took Joe under his shoulder, you know, under his wing, and and Joe used to take him up to the horse track and everything. But I was afraid of Mo as a little kid, and even, that even carried on up up until when Mo was there. I, I walked through that bag bag room, and it was like through the bag room right into the golf shop. Don't hang out in there. This is all business here. These members expect these 
he's because I, I helped him drag bags and everything like that. And but uh, Mo is great. Mo w- w- was is Wingfoot. You know that's um, you know when you look at Wingfoot and you think of the employees that have been there and how long they've been there, it's truly a family. And and um, you know it's it's a it's a great great club. Uh, my father, Claude Harmon, Mo, uh, Mike Durkin. Now uh, you've got a great head pro of Mike Gilmore, a family man. Just uh, Wingfoot is is family, and and that's what it's that's what uh, not only a, a historic and and unbelievably challenging golf course, but but it's truly a family membership. Billy and I have had the opportunity to have on our podcast Mike Durkin, who's been there as he says thirty years this year. He's yeah, a third of the time almost at Wingfoot. Jesus Lopez, uh, who's the um, master of the upper locker room, he's been there 40 years. And, it, you know, it, it, as I say, there's an invisible line between the members and the people that work there. And you said yeah, and then some of the caddies, we had Birdman and, and the Collins and boys. Collins. And that's the beauty of a place like Wingfoot. And I'm not sure about that at other famous golf courses, but we do know that from so many examples And it goes back to like the philosophy of people like your dad. And I want to just share this clip with you and have you kind of comment on it, because I think this little clip, it's a little clip about your dad's philosophy in life. And and let's see what he has to say. Play golf and meet the nicest people. I got lucky out there. My mother gave me a lot of great values. My wife and, and the kids. Um, you're lucky. If you can treat them nicely, you're going to go, they're going to treat you back. That's it. <laughs> if ever there was a person more deserving of luck, it would have to be Tom Neocordy. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> about how lucky I am to be playing here. <laughs> you can get me laughing here now. I love but, this. Look at him. Uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I can't talk for a minute. Oh, that's a great laugh. Being outdoors and uh, having a good mental attitude and uh, raising nine children and now 25 grandchildren. Oh, but boy, how lucky can you be? That's it. How lucky was the best. Be, right? Uh, your golden rule, but it was your dad who coined it. Treat people nicely and they'll treat you back. Yep. And how lucky can you be? That's. We we could we, we got to do another podcast because there's so many stories that people don't know about my father. But you know the the hour and a half commute from Long Island over to Westchester every morning. My father talked about Wingfoot and he couldn't believe that he was the head pro there. You know, I'm and, getting emotional think, thinking about it right now. But uh, he me loved too. it. Just even remembering him, yeah, he was the greatest. He was just the really best. Was. Well, this is a great tribute again as we started out to a great husband, great father, grandfather, friend, and just a gentleman extraordinaire. As I say, a thousand people played Wingfoot uh, Golf Club this last month. He'd know everybody's first name. Uh, uh, he would, and he'd know, their, he'd know their their wives' names and their friends and their guests that they brought there. He, he, he was a remarkable, remarkable man. And, and I'm proud that he was my dad. So that tempo of his golf swing, which was so beautiful, translated to his whole life, right? He was it really he was did that, that yeah. gentle soul. Yep, gentle soul. This has been great, John. We really appreciate your time. And you book another one of these. You just put some stories together, and we'll have an expanded version in the future. Friends. Yeah, let's get let's get you on with your brother Joe. Then. I would love to do that. Joe would love to do that too. He was seven years there with those pros and. And uh, it's been an honor, guys, to, to to be on your podcast to talk about Wingfoot. I it's always special coming back there and and uh, play golf and meet the nicest people. I was out lucky out there. My mother gave me a lot of great values. Things and my wife and, and the kids. I'm lucky. If you can treat them nicely, you're going to go, they're going to treat you back. That's it. <laughs> Thanks for joining Billy us Casper, today. Billy Horner. We really appreciate your Double feedback. Indemnity. And please Marky. subscribe to Two the show. Hour. 
and hit Ron the bell Harmon. icon so you get notified. Movie classic. New episodes. Mark Gable. Hit them hard. Job. And hit them off. Best 36 holes.